Welcome back to another episode of How to Live to 200. I'm T.A. McCann, and I want to thank you for joining us for another conversation about science, technology, human performance, and its effect on longevity. Today, we have Tim Gray on the show. I had a chance meeting with Tim at an event in Croatia. We happened to sit across from each other, and I was so impressed by his own personal story. How at one point, he was so fatigued, he couldn't leave his own apartment, and he was going to the bathroom 50 times a day to now where he would describe himself as a fully health-optimized human. Tim's based in London. He's a successful entrepreneur in both e-commerce and web marketing. But what made him interesting to me and hopefully to you was his dogged personal research and experimentation on his own health. Like many of our shows, we have a really wide-ranging conversation, but a few things really stood out to me as being unique. One is heavy metal toxicity. This is a condition that Tim had, and he describes lots of ways that you can test for this and very specific solutions to improve this. Second was hyperbaric oxygen. This is something before I met Tim I hadn't even heard about before, but he describes his own personal journey, his discovery of this therapy, and he loved it so much that he went on to actually open a clinic in London around hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I know this is a thing that I want to give a try. Brain health optimization. He talks a lot about different ways that he's optimized his brain, how he measures it, different supplements that he takes, and I found this incredibly interesting. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tim Gray. And now, this is How to Live to 200. So, Tim, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to relate for the audience how we met. And Mm. it was a few months ago, and we were both invited to a private island in Croatia for the meeting of the minds from a bunch of people who were some combination of biohacker, direct-to-consumer marketer, uh, and just interesting people. And we were fortunate enough to sit across from each other and started comparing notes on what we were doing. And I thought Mm -hmm. I found your your background and your story fascinating. So uh, maybe you could start with how did you get involved with the Baby Bathwater Institute and then find your way into Croatia? Yeah, wow. Okay, so it's been a bit of a journey. So I'll give you a skip through history, I guess, uh, to bring you up to speed. It would be an abridged one, but it would make sense, I guess. So um, I've been in psychology and marketing for many, many years now. um, And that had been my, my life, my passion, I guess, and um, have built and sold several companies along the way. Um, so I've kind kind of a, a typical entrepreneur with an all in or nothing approach, I guess. Um, so when I do something, I, I I tend to do it properly, or I just don't notice it. It's all in or nothing, which is quite common, I think, in 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 our areas. So um, about six years ago, uh, I started getting really ill. I started getting infections. I started having to have teeth pulled out and. Um, having really bad digestion issues, brain fog, and almost started getting depressed, I guess. And um, things started spiraling, and I just couldn't figure out what was going on. I I then started forming kidney stones um, and getting really, really, really ill, actually, and to the point where I couldn't leave the house. And I was in and out of the doctors nearly every day, and that's no exaggeration. It was really extreme. Um, and um, it stemmed from kidney problems to urinary problems, going toilet 50 times a day. No, no exaggeration either. Um, and it just get, got worse and worse and worse and worse. And all the doctors kept on doing was giving me antibiotics, um, which I now know to be a very normal issue. Um, so one day I, I said to the doctor, uh, you know, what's going on? And he said, Tim, we've tried everything and shrugged his shoulders. And that was when I realized I had to take control of this. and and start um, researching properly and moving away from what I did psychology and marketing wise to sorting my health out. It was almost like I had a gun to my head. And I guess it got to the point of where my health was so bad, I couldn't even hold an umbrella up. That was how little energy I actually had from being extremely driven, extremely motivated and full of energy um, around the clock to to that bad. Um, So just by chance, I happened to get like a really sore mouth, um, which turned out to be thrush. And it was around a filling in my mouth. And so I Googled thrush and fillings and it came up with mercury toxicity or amalgam illness, um, which um, I started researching. And um, 
very, very, very heavily. And I've met a lot of people along the way as a result. I found a holistic dentist in, in Carnaby Street in London um, who was um, an amazing dentist, actually. She's a holistic dentist. And she put me in touch with several authors that she knew of with books. And that's where the rabbit hole began, um, studying mercury toxicity, um, amalgam illness, looking into Andy Cutler's work, who is a very clever PhD that also had mercury toxicity which then got me into adrenal uh, issues, thyroid, um, hormones, gut health, and everything in between. So I had my head down probably for three or four years without having any connection to the outside world in this area because I just thought I was kind of alone and just researching on forums some of these things. And then one day I heard about Bulletproof Coffee and um, started researching the ketogenic diet. <laughs> And um, realize that there's a whole world out there called biohacking of these, uh, well, to the outside world, semi-crazy people that do lots of blood tests, collect loads of data and optimize their health with supplements and nutrition. And, um, and then I find myself today surrounded by, by many, many biohackers and crazy uh, healthy people. <laughs> How do you define that word biohacker and then the community that you're in? What does it mean? Well, so a biohacker um, essentially is not body hacking, which is a lot of people turn their nose up at the term biohacking. I actually don't like it as a term, but uh, Dave Astry from Bulletproof um, has really expanded that knowledge. I think biohacking means to optimize your health and mind and energy um, using nutrition, supplements, or any thing like your environment uh, blue blocking sunglasses um through to red light therapy etc cetera, etc cetera. so really it's, it's just a health optimization really is the is what it is um and we test i mean i test my myself twice a month it sounds crazy but i do um for many different things um in, for my blood works to see how my how my health is being optimized based on what i'm doing and why don't you like the term biohacker? <laughs> yeah, I mean I, that's a really that's a really good question because um, I, I've been quite a lot, uh, been across the states a lot, um, obviously across the UK, and I've met with many um, doctors and specialists and uh, founders of you know nutrition companies and supplements and things like this. And not everyone knows the term biohacking. They and some people turn their nose up at it, thinking it's having a, an implant to you know to to pay for your credit with your credit card or something or other something under your skin they don't realize that it's actually optimizing yourself with data and nutrition so as a result what's the goal in my mind well the goal is for health optimization and that's kind of what i want to relabel it as you know over the over the coming years um i think more and more people will understand health optimization as a term. And it's funny, I was speaking with a founder of, of, of quite a well-known supplement company last week and week before last, sorry. And he said, so how does, how can I help? And I said, well, within the biohacking circles, you know, X, Y, and Z. And he said, well, what is biohacking? And I explained it to him. And he said, well, if I knew that biohacking equaled this, then I would have certainly gone to the biohackers summit and, and been more involved in this area. And he always knew it as health optimization. Um, but there's no, there's no one that's really centralizing it to that term, which is what I'm working on doing right now. Let's go back to the test that you're running on yourself now and what you're learning. So talk us through specifically what you're looking for, what you're testing, and then we'll touch on some of the therapies that you're using based on the results. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, um, my white blood cell count has always been pretty low. Um, and the doctors have just said, well, it's low, normal. Um, um, my red blood cell count has always been quite low as well. Um, I've always, always been trying to optimize that specifically. Um, and an example of that is, is when I was, I guess my most mercury toxic and when I was really ill, um, and I couldn't keep food in and I wasn't getting the nutrients from them and my energy is my worst. My white blood cell count was the worst it had been uh, very, very low. In fact, and the doctors just obviously didn't know what was going on as I've collated um, more mercury out of my system over the last five years or so, then um, my white blood cell count has come up to be more um, middle of the range. Obviously, if you get an infection and stuff, then your white blood cell count goes up significantly. Um, so that you can obviously get false positives from time to time. 
but that's what I've been working on ultimately. There are many other tests as well, like I've been looking at my IGF um, one levels, which is growth hormone, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which I've always been low in. I've also tested myself um, with that to see how my body performs in terms of healing, which is, has actually been very good for me because I'm on the low low edge of uh, growth hormones. Um, um, I was also found to have the antibodies for Lyme's and also I got toxoplasmosis uh, about three months ago, which I've been monitoring quite closely to see um, what different supplements or uh, anti-parasites I should be using to get that um, back on track as well. And that was quite a heavy hit around the face. How are you doing the blood testing and how are you interpreting the data? Are you working with a physician on that? Are you using a <laughs> third party service? And again, how are you measuring and comparing what is normal, mm-hmm. within range, out of range, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's a very good question. Through many, many sources, um, I, I run a clinic, or should I say I own a clinic in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I have access to various doctors and things who are, I guess, my colleagues. Um, and um, they, they look over my blood test for me. I have also got to know the specific blood test that I, that I have done very, very well. I also work with an endocrinologist, um, a hematologist, uh, a urologist, and um, senior consultants, as well as nutritional therapists, and et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of them have become my friends or colleagues as a result of working in this space. Um, also, after looking at blood tests, these specific blood tests for four or five or six years, you tend to really get a, a good grip of where you should be or what your own baseline is and, and what you want to work on specifically. Let's let's go and talk about that the the mercury toxicity. That was something mm-hmm. that when we met, I found very fascinating, an area I didn't know very much about. So talk mm-hmm. talk someone through the test that you did, mm-hmm. uh, what you found, and mm-hmm. then how you went about solving it. Yeah, so I mean, I think. It's, it's really interesting about the mercury thing. It's good that you've, you've touched on this again, because I think one of the biggest things I find for a lot of people, and, and when I meet someone, I almost can tell almost immediately whether or not they've got high mercury or high lead levels. Um, it's very, very strange. I mean, it's my, my gut feeling on it. Um, and when I get friends tested, it often turns out that they are, um, like literally 90, 90% of the time. And I think that if you've, if you've got a history of metals in your mouth, for instance, or you've eaten a lot of tuna or salmon because they are some of the most toxic foods you can have, um, and then you're not going to be having the right gut bacteria in your gut because your, your gut lining will be full of metals, basically, which kills off certain gut bacteria, which means you don't get certain nutrients from your food, um, which means you get deficiencies, which means your body doesn't work correctly. So it has it's a spiraling effect. And I mean, I've done a cause and effect chart in terms of hierarchy of every symptom or any issue I've ever had and mapped it out with post-it notes on the wall in the hierarchy system. And everything always traces back to the level of mercury that I had. So I know that by fixing the mercury or getting the mercury out of my body, things like the nutritional deficiencies um, or the, the hydration issues or gut bacteria issues, et cetera, et cetera, will all come good eventually. But the point is, is targeting some of these symptoms first so that you're not feeling terrible while you're fixing the mercury problem. So for me, um, initially, there, a nutritional therapist I worked with years ago said, get a, a hair mineral analysis test done through BioLab or someone or other like that, um, which showed that I was high in mercury, which confirmed, obviously, what I'd been believing after having thrush in my mouth. Um, and so I started researching mercury toxicity and, and spoke with my holistic dentist about it. And I read a book called the mercury diaries, which is one of my top 10 books, uh, written by a, a city trader from London, uh, who was very, very mercury toxic, um, which kind of taught me about Andy Cutler, who was, um, a very well-known PhD, um, doctor that had mercury toxicity and all the things that you should look out for along the way and his his mindset was to collate mercury out using alpha lipoic acid or edta um, based on its half-life whereas most collation therapists i guess not that there's many across the world say just take you know a supplement once a day or have IV therapy to get the metal out but what that does is it picks up the metals temporarily and then they drop back in your system somewhere else. Whereas Andy cut this route is take a tablet every three hours round the clock for three days, which means that you build up a, a certain level of the collator in your bloodstream 
and you collate it out over a period of time and then it just drops at the end of the round of collation once. Um, so that's the way that I've done probably about 80 or 90 rounds of mercury collation every three hours round the clock for three or four days a week for many years. Um, and that works very, very well, but it's very tough on the kidneys um, and it doesn't necessarily address the gut problems. And as as you probably know, TA, with many people you meet, that like the gut the gut is a big issue for many, many people. Probably 70%, 80% of people I meet have something going on with their gut. And whether that's just due to lack of gut bacteria because of antibiotics or whether or not they've had metals in their mouth, which means that they've killed off a lot of certain bacteria, or just because they don't feed themselves the right diet, they don't um, promote the right bacteria in their guts. So uh, recently, uh, Christopher Shade from Quicksilver Scientific, um, he's brought out a newer range of um, products and a collation protocol, which I found to be very, very good. And it's literally about three months old. Um, and it's called push and catch. So essentially, it speeds up the liver, um, makes the liver eject uh, more bile, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, while cleansing the gut using a particular binder, which then helps the gut settle um so you can repopulate the gut bacteria without the mercury killing it off so it's a very 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 good system actually and i've i've tested it over the last two or three months um and have seen a bigger increase in the last three months than i did from a year of collation with the andy cutler protocol so i'm, I'm very very happy with that actually what is it what does a hair mineral analysis cost and what would you recommend if somebody wanted to do that how they would go about it yeah so there's um there's a doctor's data hair mineral analysis test, which um, is about $100, I think, in the States. Um, there's a website called holistichealer.com, I think it is, which is they can order the hair test for you. And then they send it off to the company that does that doctor's data. And then they give you a determination of what they think, what their, I guess, um, what their analysis of the results are. I don't necessarily agree with other people's readings of what the mercury levels say because when you look at the hair mineral analysis test, it often says that you're deficient in lithium, um, in calcium, you're deficient in loads of different things. But what that does is under the Andy Cutler um, protocol, it basically says that if you're deficient in 10 different things, then you're not using your minerals correctly, which means you're deficient in those, which means mercury is screwing with you. Um, or if you have super high levels of toxicities of minerals as well. Um, Christopher Shade does a tr what we call a tri-test where it checks your urine, your blood, and your hair and compares the three to give you a, a more true reading, but I think it's about $500. That would be my preference, uh, definitely. But I think with doctor's data at $100, it really does give you a strong indication of what you, uh, what you have and whether or not it's worth collating. And when you, you mentioned that oftentimes you, when you meet somebody, you have a very good sense quickly about <laughs> either a lead or mercury problem. What mm. is it that you normally see about them? What question do you ask? And if you think about our audience mm. asking themselves those questions to say, mm. hmm, that sounds like me, or mm. maybe I'd like to go and get that test based on these characteristics. Yeah. So, um, it's just, I know I've, I've, queried this for many years with many people I've met along the road as well as mercury toxic people and holistic dentists and whatnot mercury toxic people are usually very almost OCD they're very very particular they can be quite calm most of the time but then flare up massively like really go off the handle lose it lose the plot they can be very focal i.e very all in or nothing type i.e they're they're very committed to whatever they're doing and um, don't really venture outside of that. They can get quite high in anxiety. Now, obviously, they have a low immune problems. Sometimes they have very, very dark lines around their eyes because certain nutrients that they need to be healthy um, aren't getting into their system because of their gut issues and whatnot. So they're very, very can be very closed down, closed minded, but also quite crazy. If you know the, the saying mad as a hatter, that comes from the olden days where people that made hats um, would use mercury in the lining, which would make them crazy, <laughs> um, which is where the term comes from. Um, so, so yeah, often they can be quite out there characters um, and very, very all in or nothing opposed to people that are lead, lead toxic, um, which basically makes them very, very placid, very, very chilled out and withdrawn. And they always feel like they're a wallflower. They don't, they can't quite engage with the world around them and they feel you know, very withdrawn. Um, they also often have hydration issues and quite fatigued as well. So uh, they're the two, I guess, polar opposites in terms of one being crazy and out there and very extrovert and very 
very strong and the other one very withdrawn and chilled out. And now that you know this about yourself with the, with the uh, mercury and lead sort of toxicity, mm. are there certain foods that you will never eat again mm-hmm. and or certain things that you do to really protect your body knowing that you've had that? And I, and I also want to mm. touch on the, the dental ca- characteristics. Mm. Yeah. So um, obviously I would never eat salmon again unless it's wild, um, not farm salmon, salmon or tuna. Um, Farm salmon, I mean, I, th- I think there was a video by Dr. McCola about a year ago, which which really made me realize how bad it actually was, is that farm salmon is f- fed on uh, fish food that's been made from the bottom of the Baltic Sea. It's been collected up. It's got loads of chemicals in it. It's full of antibiotics. And this salmon that's farmed is really, really, really ill. Um, and then we're fed it. And so it has high levels of mercury from the fish food and um, loads of antibiotics and it's just so bad for you so that's number one and also you'll find that a lot of bodybuilders um, and people are generally quite mercury toxic because they eat a lot of tuna in their diet they think it's healthy for them but in fact it's really 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 bad and I think from memory um, Tony Robbins is very open about having mercury toxicity it's been in the press quite a lot and I think that was from swordfish and tuna mainly so um I mean, that's, those are two things that I would never go near anymore unless it was wild and not farmed. Um, and the yeah. point the point about, about your teeth, yeah. the choices that you made about your teeth and what changes did you make there? Yeah, so I, I had them removed safely. Um, so basically a standard dentist is mostly globally, not in Germany because they've, they've ruled out merc- amalgam fillings, but they most dentists would say no we don't believe in that we don't believe in amalgam illness we don't believe that it could be poisoned it's you know it shows that there's nothing wrong going on here well it's funny because there are other videos going around on the internet showing that when you actually brush a, an amalgam filling the actual um vapors that come off of the filling are quite significant well over any safe levels if you're pregnant they will not let you have a, an amalgam filling because it could be dangerous to the baby so why isn't it dangerous to the mum um, so standard dentists would say, oh no, there's nothing there. And if you persuade them, they will take the fillings out for you. Um, but they won't necessarily do it safely. So they'll be drilling and cutting this mercury, which you'll then be breathing in as it's coming out with a mercury safe dent with mercury safe dentistry. They put, um, like a, a rubber guard around the tooth and cut it out in one piece or extract the tooth or whatever, so that you don't breathe in more vapors as they're doing their work. And that's really, really keen, key, um, key because so many people have been ill for many years can't put their finger on what's wrong with their health then they get their fillings taken out they get worse and then in three months or so as their body starts clearing stuff out naturally depending on their genetics and i'll touch on that in a minute um they sometimes overnight get better where their body's not being constantly topped up with mercury from their fillings other people it can take several months um and months and months and months an example is that my mum, she had migraines and osteopenia as well um, for many years. Uh, she wasn't, um, she was getting migraines and couldn't figure out what was going on from her early 20s. We get her fillings taken out. We get her put on a gentle collation protocol. And of course, the headaches and migraines start lifting. And uh, one thing that she said to me, which is actually quite a big moment for me, was I can't believe I've been in this cloud my whole adult life. And you know, I've only just found out about this now, you know, it literally changed, changed her. So, I mean, that was a, I was quite proud <laughs> of that moment for my mum to say that. Um, and it's very, very normal for people that are mercury toxic to have that with regards to uh, genetics, uh, depending on your genetics. Um, if you have the MTHFR gene mutation, which you can find out from having a 23andMe genetic test done, you can detox mercury quite well. So some people can have metal fillings and not ever feel any issues. Some people um, may feel rubbish while they got their fillings out and then feel great as soon as they've come out because their genetics are great for detoxing this stuff. And other people just feel crap for years and years and years until they actually do proper collation. Um, and the gene mutation MTHFR is a, governs how quickly your body detoxes naturally or properly. If you come back to the the point you made about Dr. Christopher Shade, mm. what does a protocol like that cost? So in some ways, even if you did the test and you were sort of modest to low in mercury, mm. wouldn't you just go ahead and do that depending on its sort of relative cost and or complexity? Yeah. So uh, the Christopher Shade protocol um, is, um, is actually for me, it's fairly good value, I believe. Um, like you can have a, a 
two months worth of collation, I think, for a couple of hundred dollars. Um, the Andy Cutler protocol is based on alpha lipoic acid mainly, which is a supplement that you can get for five milligrams from a company in South Africa, I think, called Living Supplements. And you can buy them for $12 a bottle, and that will keep you going for a few months. So one isn't as effective as the other, but Christopher Shade's protocols really have been fine-tuned by him very, very well. And I think for a couple of hundred dollars for a couple of months, it will get you you know, probably 15 or 20% of the way there. I think it's well worth it, considering it helps you get your health back on track very quickly. Yeah, cool. Well, as you might recall, when we met in Croatia... Um, I was talking about this product that we've been working on called personal science and mm. we've actually had Richard, Richard on the show. He was actually the first episode of the, of the podcast mm. talking about microbiome mm. and his project around the ability to have a simple microbiome test, upload my results, make it quick to compare to other people. And in your particular case, making it easy to compare with people who may have the same kind of conditions mm. to find out what's unique about you or what's common between a collection of different people with any number of different sort of maladies. Mm. Uh, and so I'm interested in how you've used micro, how you've been studying microbiome, what tests you've been doing, what you've learned and what you've changed about your diet. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Great, great point. I mean, this is a, one of the main things I guess that we talked about um, when we met. And I, I think the, the, the microbiome is a really, really, really interesting complex thing. Um, and for me, when I when I meet someone, if it's a, a friend or a family member, um, and they say, "Tim, can you can you help me?" Well, I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor or, or anything. I'm just a very keen biohacker about health optimization. I like to help people where I can, if it's something that's outside of my knowledge. And obviously, I recommend them onto a specialist accordingly. But I often start with um, a test called uh, the organic acids test, uh, which is um, from Bio Labs. And that, that checks gut, um, as in checks yeast levels within your urine. It checks um, things like methylation status and whether or not you've got leaky gut, which is a controversial term, um, but in my opinion, it is a very, very real one. Um, so that tells you what is being excreted in your urine. So that's number one. And if it's high in yeast levels, which I find many, many people are, especially with the high sugar diets, you're literally just throwing petrol on a fire every day. Um, and if you've got low gut bacteria or if you've been on the pill, or you've taken, you know, the contraceptive pill, or if you've been on antibiotics and you'll find that your gut bacteria levels are low, your systemic yeast levels are high, um, which then obviously plays with your energy and um, digestion as well. So that's the test number one that I, that I have to recommend. Um, and I've played around with Ubiome um, before and um, Genova's GI Comprehensive uh, test as well, which gives you a really good good level of bacteria. Um, then, then from that, obviously, you work out whether or not there's a yeast problem that you need to work on, or whether or not you need to repopulate the gut or change the diet and everything in between. So, I think um, one thing that I, I particularly liked when we met was obviously about the, the the gut bacteria test and the tracking of it because I've done that manually myself now for three or four years. Um, Ubiome was one thing that I did use and I've, I've subscribed to that for a while um, and GI comprehensive test as well but that's a manual thing it's not necessarily all in one central point tracking it to see um, where you can annotate changes that you've done um, so that's that's one thing and I guess with the bacteria that I've actually used um, one in the UK is an amazing um, probiotic called Simprove and it's a water-based probiotic um, and as a result, it doesn't trigger your digestive enzymes um, and repopulates the gut very, very well. And I've tried, I must have spent eight to 10,000 pounds on, on probiotics in the last two or three years, I guess, um, when I started measuring these things. And um, yeah, Simprove and Chuckling Goat, Goat's Kefir are probably the two most significant ones that I've, I've used that really have helped. Um, also on top of that we use or should i say i recommend to use uh, to my friends is something called restore which i think is bigger in the states than it is in the uk and that apparently helps seal leaky gut um and is soil based in some description so i found that those work very very well my gut status is now absolutely perfect and that was my goal for the year to absolutely nail that how do you know what what exactly are you measuring mm -hmm. 
yeah. around that to know that your gut is in perfect shape. Yeah. So, um, well, in January, I, I spent, I think it was about $1,500 um, on a whole, a whole host of tests to check it from all angles. Um, and I knew that after going on the ketogenic diet, for instance, all the systemic yeast levels that had been that had grown in the time I was on antibiotics were, had been reset. Um, so I knew that the least yeast levels were significantly lower, um, but I wasn't digesting food properly. I was still getting a bit of bloating. Um, and um, let's just say consistency of stool could be better. Um, and I, I find that a lot of people on this journey have either had really real tough issues with their gut in terms of um ease ease of going toilet or the opposite of it's too easy to go toilet and too frequent and i think for me the it's a subjective measure to some extent but also backed up by data as well so um the organic acids test is one thing for me that i've mentioned a couple of times that um checks for systemic yeast levels and what comes out in the urine and that for me tells me about the leaky gut status and if it's high in yeast arabinose or whatnot then you know that there's an imbalance because you've got too much yeast in your gut um the other thing is obviously the the genova gifx comprehensive stool test that tells you about your flora um, and what what gut bacteria you're potentially low in uh, i mean it, it is an area that needs to be improved definitely from a testing perspective and i think what we talked about with what you're bringing out um is very very good to be able to track it over a period of time which is why i was so excited to hear about it i feel like you biome have touched on it but not really pushed it forward properly um so it's partly test-based um, and it's partly subjective. And I think for me, I was going anywhere to, to give you <laughs> TMI maybe, but uh, between three and 10 times a day. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't good, which means I wasn't digesting my food properly, which means I wasn't getting the nutrients properly. So my goal was to make my gut normal. And that was in terms of consistency and, and times going and how long I'd hold on to my food for. And using things like activated charcoal, you can actually tell the transit time of the foods that you're eating um, when you need to test it from time to time. So for instance, for me, it was just to make sure that my gut stabilized, that the consistency was fine and that I was digesting my food properly. And then obviously rounding off with a test to see that the systemic levels stayed down and the gut bacteria levels stayed up. And I think with um, using probiotics for a month, uh, a week every month, Um, helps me keep at that level otherwise you're just throwing more and more probiotics in continuously which isn't optimal with all these tests that you do Mm. where do you keep the data Mm -hmm. i mean we're analytics geeks here Mm. uh and a lot of people who listen to this podcast are very uh analytics oriented certainly numbers oriented the whole category of biohacking has a has a decent amount of orientation Mm. what do you do for keeping the data tracking the data trending the data, how do you do that today? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, I, I, for, a, for a long time, I would just print every single blood test or test that I had and kept a folder, which is now four or five folders. Um, <laughs> and that, that became too much information in too many different places, in too many different formats. So I created a spreadsheet um, that I track quite a few different data points every single day of my life. Uh, I'm just going to have a look now. So I've got uh, 29 points of data that I check every day. And that starts from a subjective wellness score, um, energy, mental clarity. Um, and then I obviously put things in whether or not I've been to the gym or had some aniracetam nootropics for brain clarity, what my ketone levels are, what my urine pH is, what my sulfur levels are, um, whether or not I've got protein in the urine because that was a historical issue, uh, headaches, um sleep percentage score which i use the aura tracking ring for that so i check track my sleep and have hacked my sleep which is probably my biggest second big second or third biggest biohack of all actually um yeah uh weight specific gravity of urine to see if i'm hydrated correctly if i've been having coffee um and then as well as various other various other markers as well, and then what I do is I analyze that within uh, within Excel, so I can see trends yeah. and things like that. So it's very very specific. That's super cool. Mm. 
let's let's you just mentioned it quickly on on brain health and sleep. Mm-hmm. Let's go into just a little bit more depth there on what are you doing to optimize your brain and your cognition and your brain performance, and how do you measure it? Yeah, yeah. again, an, another great question. Um, I mean, I think um, my my most important biohack or health optimization thing is sleep definitely um sleep and nutrition which comes back to gut status obviously so i've had the aura ring for best part of a year um now which tracks obviously your sleep deep sleep REM sleep light sleep and the different obviously the different phases what your activity is your waking time uh, bedtime steps i mean i think they track about 100 different data points and report on probably 20 or 30 of them um and i found that by hacking my sleep i i operate much much better so for instance i know that if i have a blackout blind and i'm not woken by the sun um if i use a an earthing or grounding bed sheet where i'm uh, connect i guess connected to the plug socket but not for positive energy just for earthing out um if I use uh, tea tree essential oils uh, in a vaporizer, for instance, um, in the room when I go to sleep, um, if I use silicon earplugs is another one. If I have my posture correct in bed, if I have the room temperature correct, um, and if I've used blue blocking glasses before bed, then I know that I can hack my sleep to get into the 90, 92 to 95% um, sleep quality. And that's also time of bed as well. So, for instance, if it's before 11 o'clock, then I get a higher score. So I've, I've tested all of these different things. I've also thrown in uh, CBD, hemp oil uh, as well, and various other different forms of hemp to see how my sleep uh, reacts to that. And, yes, it does work really, really well. Um, so, um, yeah, I would say that if I get into the 90 percentile, I am absolutely flying the next day. My brain is very, very clear on a probably a subjectively 95 out of 100 in cl- mental clarity. Um, and I have to take several anoracetam to get anywhere near that level or have had hyperbaric oxygen therapy the day before to get to that sort of level. And assuming you have a good couple of nights sleep, what are you doing during the day from a optimizing brain health perspective? So I, I use nootropics um, probably one or two days a week, depending on what I've got going on. Or if I'm speaking at an event or presenting, then yeah, I, I take anoracetam. Um, I find that that's really good because it plays on the choline receptors in the brain. Um, and it's more natural than taking things like modafinil, um, which is, in my mind, is a no pun intended is a dirty dirty drug and i i don't recommend using it at all um so anoracetam is very very good i find um i find hydration is probably a a really good hack for mental clarity um hyperbaric oxygen therapy as well and i think when my brain is as quick and efficient as it ever could be is when i'm actually on the ketogenic diet and i'm my ketone levels are high um i find that that is just like like unicorn fuel (laughs) i mean i cannot the brain is so clear my energy is so high um taking any nootropic or doing any other hack doesn't go anywhere near being on the ketogenic diet in my opinion but it's not necessarily sustainable forever um Mm. i find that if i have a key uh for instance uh uh and i have a good night's sleep and I have hyperbaric, then my mental clarity gets to about 95 out of a hundred subjective score. If I have um, a good dose of anoracetam, I can get it to 93, 94. If I'm on ketogenic diet, it's 99. I mean, and, and taking anoracetam or having hyperbaric just doesn't get my brain any clearer. And, and so it's very difficult not being in that state and eating carbs and stuff, but it's not sustainable forever in my opinion. And, I, and, and now I'm going to change subject just a little bit mm. because when I met you, I had never even really heard of, other than in a mountain climbing sort of sense, hyperbaric oxygen. <laughs> yep. Clearly, you are very passionate about that. So let's start kind of at the simple level is, mm. what is it? What do you use it for? Mm. And let's get into mm. HBO territory. Yep. Okay, cool. So, I mean... The, the, the funny thing is, is that all of these supplements or the different treatments are all great to help optimize your health. Um, but they're all, I think they're all plasters in all honesty. Um, so I think I heard Dave uh, Asprey uh, from the Bulletproof 
uh, podcast mention hyperbaric oxygen therapy through two and a half years ago, I guess. Um, and he said that it was really good for your brain, your energy, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I hunted everywhere for a, a clinic that I could go to self-refer. Um, and there wasn't really anyone around in, in England or near London that I could uh, get into. So I went and tried one somewhere eventually. And as I, I left, I, I was very, very tired actually. And I fell asleep on the train on the way home. And I knew because that's something that I wouldn't do, that something significant had shifted. Um, that night I slept the best I'd slept for many, many years actually. Uh, and the next day I was just so full of energy, mentally clear um, and sharp that I knew that there was something in it. So I tested it over the next couple of months um, with Dr. Pender, uh, who's a well-known specialist over here. And I loved it so much, but I was spending a lot of time commuting outside of London and I run several companies and don't really have time to do that. Although I wanted my health to be optimal. So I decided to open a clinic (laughs) in London so that I could have access to it. Essentially what it is, is it, it gives you 97.7% oxygen at an atmospheric depth of uh, 1.5 to 2 ATA, which is around up to 30 feet underwater in equivalent of pressure. And what that does is, and I'll I'll say it like an analogy uh, that I often do, is if if you water a plant with half the water that it needs to survive, it will live, but it won't flourish. The body is like that with oxygen. So if you're living in a city that's uh, polluted, and it's far more polluted than we realize, um, I think I heard the other day that oxygen levels are around 17% in cities. Um, I haven't verified that, but that's apparently what it is, opposed to 22 that we're supposed to operate at. Then we're always, you know, say 20% deficient in oxygen. And cumulatively, that has a big impact on how the body works, because we only have to go without oxygen for a few minutes to know how important it is, (laughs) or even a minute. Um, You know, we cannot survive without it. So therefore, if we're losing a little bit here and there, continuously, how's our body going to operate? It's going to be like a plant that isn't watered properly, it will live, but it just won't flourish. So what hyperbaric oxygen therapy does is it, it it essentially means that you can dissolve more oxygen in the blood than you can at, at normal atmospheric pressure. And um, apparently that's up to about 15 times more oxygen in your blood. If you're not having it administered under pressure, then you only have a few percent more oxygen in your bloodstream. Or you just get dizzy from excess oxygen. Whereas in your in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, then you dissolve more. And I guess the a simple analogy to pair with the other one is If you put a tablespoonful of sugar in a glass of cold water and stir it, some of the sugar will dissolve, but it won't completely dissolve. As soon as you warm that water up, the sugar will disappear into the water um, and saturates completely. The oxygen is like that in the blood under pressure. So you actually get far more. So we find that we have, um, because the brain uses a lot of the oxygen, uh, one of the first things to become foggy is the brain because it doesn't get enough oxygen to it. Or if you have low red blood cell count, for instance, and you're not oxygenated properly, you lose energy. Um, Having hyperbaric oxygen therapy and flooding your body with oxygen means that your body can operate at the level it should do. And we've had, uh, I can't name them, but many famous athletes and sportsmen through the clinic, um, as well as TV stars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And it makes such a big difference very, very quickly for people, almost immediately. But it is just a plaster, in my opinion, to help your body operate where it should do, give it a kickstart. Realistically, in my opinion, you need to address the initial issue, which could be gut-related because you're not getting the nutrients from your food, or it could be that you've got a really bad posture um, and your lungs aren't working at capacity, or you could be living in a city, or it could be that you have a low red, red blood cell count due to def- uh, nutrient deficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. So while hyperbaric oxygen therapy will help a lot of r- right a lot of wrongs, it's not necessarily something to take or have forever. Um, although I've been having it for two years and feel great for it. <laughs> Is there an ability to do too much or for too long as you think about the longer term mm. effects of that treatment? Yes and no. Um, under the right protocols, then no, it's not. And that's, that needs to be a protocol needs to be put together by a hyperbaric specialist, such as Dr. Pender. Um, there are not clinics, but necessarily, I guess, um, 
places around the country that does offer hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's not necessarily administered by a hyperbaric specialist. Um, and you can obviously get oxygen toxicity under our protocols or Dr. Pender's protocols. That's not possible um, because you don't have long enough exposure to it. And I think it's the classic example uh, or a way of explaining this would be that if you're provided with the right amount of oxygen, your body will operate as it's meant to operate, just like any of these biohacks will get your body to operate at the level it should operate. You can overclock your body for a very short period of time, but you will crash. So basically any biohack or any of these things that you're doing is getting your body or brain to operate at the level it should have done if it didn't have any toxicities or any illnesses. So that's a key distinction for biohacking for me. Whereas people that say you can overclock your brain or your body, sure, you can take amphetamines and things, but you will crash and you'll have an equal opposite negative reaction to it, which is the downtime. So your net e- your net energy will remain the same just to have a spike before and a drop after. Biohacking, in my mind, is bringing your body to the level it should operate at. Um, it, that With the right amount of oxygen, your body will not have too much it's about giving it the right amount and with the right protocols you can't do you can't get over what is, what is the normal routine so for two different kinds of people just a normal entrepreneur that's out there trying to you know optimize their wellness or their health mm. and let's say for a sportsman or somebody who's trying to live at a physically a higher level mm. what what would be the normal routine for using uh, the hyperbaric oxygen? Well, I think the sportsman and the entrepreneur or exec- uh, high, high executive are very similar because I think they're both sportsmen, uh, just with different, different applications. I think a lot of entrepreneurs run at 200 mile an hour um, and never stop still, the same as athletes. Um, and I think that, sure, you can come in and have a session and uh, feel have great energy for a, up to a week or so as a result of having it, which is great and it helps you operate before um, – an important meeting or it helps with jet lag in my opinion um that's one thing a sports person if they're having a competition they may have it for an hour a day for three days before and then to recover afterwards for a few days and i think the reason the reason being especially if you've had an operation i mean that's a different thing last year i had an operation and it was supposed to be a three to four month healing period um and i was in having a session every day for six weeks basically an hour and a half a day and within three weeks the majority of the wound had healed up the surgeon couldn't couldn't believe it he said it's not normal to heal that quickly um i mean you only have to have a plaster on a cut to see it not heal up uh, because it doesn't get oxygen to it when you rip the plaster off it heals properly well if you can do that from the inside out how quickly does the body heal so for people with operations we work with plastic surgeons to get their patients in so especially with uh, celebrities that have had plastic surgery for instance they can get them back out on the street very very quickly or much quicker um, sports people before and after um, their competitions um, boxers we've worked with as well formula uh, one race car drivers etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's it's good for mental clarity it's good for energy it's good for healing and prep before and after so you've done a great uh, service by sharing a lot of this information. I also know that you're involved or you've founded the London Biohacker Group. So tell me a little bit about that mm. and some of the great things you've learned from that community you've created in, mm. in London. Mm. Um, so, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, opening the clinic was, was great fun, um, almost a couple of years ago. And I, I reached out to quite a few people on Instagram to say, look, do you want to come and try out this amazing biohack, um, and, and give me feedback on it. So I got to know quite a few, few people, including the bulletproof guys and, um, some, several of the other podcasts in the UK here and, um, people all over the world actually it's been incredible and when i went to bulletproof conference last year in pasadena uh, there was a really great community of biohackers and health optimizers and it was such a great warm feeling met some so many amazing people um and when i got back to the uk i wanted to build a social circle like that here so i created a meetup group called biohacker london social social group and whatnot which is now around 350 or 400 people since november And it's grown very, very quickly. The people are all actually really friendly, all in it to um, become better, optimized. Um, Some of them are high achievers, a lot of entrepreneurs, people that have had health issues and stuff. But they're all such a good group of people. It's incredible. Um, 
And I've built a social circle, which was my goal, but it's become much bigger than that, much, much bigger than that. We've got people that have got that have actually started companies as a result in the biohacking space, such as a red light therapy a company called Red Light Rising's come out of it. There's um, a ketogenic supplement company that comes along. There's a cryotherapy company, London Cryo. There's ketosupplements.co.uk. There's a company called Fitty London. These are all part of all part of the meetup and everyone's helping collaboratively um we've got a facebook group where everyone chats pretty much every day about all these things and shares these awesome findings i saw one earlier on about um a, an article from mccola that was shared out in the group just about arthritis and alzheimer's and how it's linked to limes or so mccola believes and it's, it's sharing information and knowledge about that and seeing how everyone engages um is incredible um, and I guess the natural progression has been that this group has got so big so quickly um, that so many people have said, well, you should do a conference, which is, I guess, how it got me to the Baby Bathwater um, Institute, really. I went to see one of the main biohackers from Scandinavia. His name's Timu. Um, speak doing a TED Talk in the Cheese Grater building in London. Um, and he was talking about how he tracks his data and very similar to the things I do, but more technical um, slightly more technical focus than me. And um, I met a guy there who's bringing out a food app in the UK called Food Styles, which essentially is an app that um, you can put in your diet any new, uh, any things that you need to avoid and whatnot, and it will tell you the restaurants that you should eat at. You can then get your friend to do the same on their phone and then pair it up, and you can see which restaurants that you is perfect and meals that you can eat together in the local area. Um, his name's Jacob and he's an incredible guy, um, with some really great ideas in this space. And he invited me to baby bathwater. So many of the people have said, look, this is amazing. You're spreading the word, you're, you know, optimizing health and, and bringing more awareness to it. So why don't you do a conference, which is what I'm working on at the moment, the health optimization summit for London, 2019. <laughs> so it's been a progression. <laughs> One of the other things I loved about our conversation in Croatia was how well read you were. And I imagine you have three, four, five books that you would recommend that anybody in our audience would read to learn more about these topics. Um, maybe you can sort of highlight a few of those. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, yeah, last year I read 47 books <laughs> um, and most of them are on pretty, pretty detailed stuff. I mean, I've gone quite a lot into mindset and things lately as well. Um, I think my, my, one of my favorite books in this area is The Mercury Diaries, which I mentioned already. Um, that's by, um, by, as I say, a city trader from London who had mercury toxicity. It's an amazing book. It's a big eye opener to someone that doesn't know what biohacking is or didn't before we became friends um, and how he figured this stuff out for himself. Uh, so that's a really, really good one. So if you have had metal fillings or you do have immune system problems or um, you think that you've eaten a lot of tuna, then I would really, really recommend reading The Mercury Diaries. Um, there's also um, Amalgam Illness by Dr. Andy Cutler as well, which is a, more of a scientific book. It seems like a textbook, but it really helps you navigate mercury toxicity and chelation therapy. Um, obviously, I would really recommend looking into Christopher Shade and his Quicksilver protocols. There's a lot of good stuff on YouTube for this, and that will help guide you through that. Um, I think probably my favorite book of all time, which is a really big claim considering how many I've read, but, um, is when you're going through health issues or optimizing, or you live a busy life and times get hard, a book by Ryan holiday called the obstacle is the way is probably my favorite book of all time because it's how to turn something that's negative into a positive. And I think when people have said, you must be really upset of losing so many years of your life to health problems, I'm like, no, I'm very, very, very grateful for it. And the journey that I've had and the amazing people I've got to meet as a result. Um, and so I am thankful that I've been through this journey, one, because I've grown up as a man opposed to being a selfish, <laughs> selfish boy, um, to helping people and really um, surrounding myself with exceptional people. And I, I, that's a mindset from the obstacle is the way, which comes from stoicism originally. Um, there's also another book called uh, Stop the Thyroid Madness, which is um, all about the thyroid and how the medical system doesn't necessarily understand um, 
what is actually going on with thyroid. And for a lot of people, especially um, women at a certain age, it can be a massive thing for energy and depression and fix so many things that the medical system just doesn't help with right now. That's great. And it, and it brings us all the way back full circle to meeting in Croatia mm. and, and setting the foundation for even more of this sharing. So I think you, you touched on this briefly about um, your perfect uh, microbiome, but um, I'd love to just know more generally, how do you know when you're done? How do you define that? Um, it's a fair point. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, <laughs> again, a great question. Um, I mean, I strive for excellence, not mediocrity. And I think um, you can always strive for more. And I think a lot of people, some of the biggest, most successful people on the planet are never happy with where they are. They're always striving for the next thing, which means they don't necessarily enjoy the moment that they're in. Um, which is like, if you look at even Elon Musk, he's never happy with where he is. He's always trying to get to the next level. And I think with my health, I want to be full of energy every day. I don't want to have down times. I don't want to catch colds. I don't want to have digestive problems when I go traveling. Um, and I want to have a sharp brain and not have emotional ups and downs. And I feel like at one point I was correct 15% of the time, 10, 15% of the time. Now I'm correct 95% of the time. Like, and I, while a hundred percent is a big, <laughs> a big ask, I think, um, being on the hamster wheel, um, of always chasing the next big high is something I'll probably be on, always be on to some extent. Um, there's always going to be something that pops up in all honesty, but at the same time, the, the times here in the UK have asked to do an article on me, um, because they're looking at people that are uh, addicted to health optimization or health the health industry. Um, so I, I do identify that I'm an all in or nothing type and I've got to be careful. <laughs> like fasting, for instance, I'll, I could quite easily fast for three or four days without being bothered about eating because I feel so good when I'm fasting, but that can easily turn into an eating disorder <laughs> very, very easily. Tim, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing all of this information. Where can people find you online? Um, so the best thing is to go to Biohacker uh, London Facebook group um, where, we've, where we're very, very active. There's healthoptimization.com at the moment, which is just in progress. Uh, optimization with an S because we're British. Um, and that's a just coming soon page at the moment where I'm working on, on all of that in the background. So yeah. Thanks very much and uh, keep the conversation going. Yeah, cool. Will do. Thanks to you. You've been listening to another episode of How to Live to 200. Thank you so much for joining me and exploring this world together. I get a ton of help from the L200 crew that includes Lauren Krajinski and Kevin Kirkpatrick. The theme music is composed by Emmett McCann. Yes, that's my nephew. You can learn more about this and other episodes at our website, livingto200.com or find us on Twitter or Instagram at how to live to 200, where we post lots of photos of cool things. It's early days for this podcast, so we would appreciate any and all comments or telling a friend or two about what we're doing over here. It might be irresponsible for you to keep it a secret. Until next time, eat right, get lots of sleep, keep good numbers, and be looking around the corner for the next big breakthrough. If we're going to live a long time, we better do it well. <laughs>